Let's try sitting up on the platform. Yeah. Good morning. Man, that is good. <laughs> so you know I'm going to get loud later on because I'm not loud right now. Welcome to the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us be glad. Man, it is so glad that um, October 1st was yesterday, which meant that the conference forms were turned in yesterday at the latest. <sighs> Everybody just... <sighs> oh my goodness, talk about finals week. Um, we, have a, we, are, we have a plethora of things. I like that word plethora. Can everybody say plethora? Plethora. We have a plethora of things going on, including on Wednesday the 5th, the Methodist women are meeting at 6 p.m. Is that here? I don't know if y'all were going to be down at, like, my place or... or, or oh, that's later. That's, that's at 6.30. Okay. Um, and let's just look at, the, look at the back of the bulletin on the calendar part. Uh, we have... Uh, so confirmation class is ending this month, and at the very last Sunday of the month, we are going to have a special service for them, as well as anybody that has been coming here to Emmanuel that either, it's been a long time, and you just want to reconfirm, re reassert your, your membership in the church, or maybe you've been coming in a long time and you haven't been a member, and you just want to commit yourself to the, to the family of the church. Um, so we will have something on the last the last Sunday, which is the 30th. And then just look through the board. And there's like 17,000 things we're doing right now. If, if you haven't figured out, we see we do um, the animal shelter drive. We've got, what, two drives for John Humberg going on for food right now. We've got the Thanksgiving food going on. Um, everybody in the church is on some committee, most likely. And there's meetings after meetings after meetings this month. So please keep a look at them. Um, any, any joys or concerns? Besides John yawning in the back already. Yes. By the way, it is a joy to have you two back. When, when you said that um, you were having some pains, I was like, well, I know. You always bring them with you. Yeah. Yeah. Keep hoping. Keep hoping. And it just, I, I got to tell you, there are a lot of people that come to church here, but I definitely miss you two when you're sitting in the back. And if I don't see you in the back, I start wondering, okay, did they get into a car accident? Were they this? So I'm glad both of you are back. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, speaking of prayers... Everybody should have gotten a um, list of the prayer chain, and we're still adding names to it, so if you don't see your name on it, just make sure you let us know. It'll be added to it. Um, I do like our one-call system, and I do like that for emergencies and other things, but I also like that personal touch where we're actually talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, and I like that attitude with the prayer chain. So um, if you'd like to be part of the prayer chain and you're not on the list, then um, let me know or send a message to Denise and let her know to be put on it, and we'll make sure you're on it. And then we'll have the final one out you know, by the end of the month. Any other, any other prayers of joy or concern? Yes. Libby. Yes, we need to pray for Libby Witt. She was in the hospital with a um, bloody nose. Um, so let's just keep praying for her that everything is resolved and she's able to go home and um, as far as I know, the last time I heard, which was yesterday, she was in the hospital. Yeah. So keep her in your prayers. Keep Ray in your prayers, too. Uh, any others? Yes. We will definitely keep Chris in our prayers. Thank you, thank you. Sean. Yeah. 
Oh, that is fantastic. They are, and let's also keep um, Angie in our prayers, the director, the local director for Fellowship of Christian Athletes, for doing such a fantastic job. And my gosh, it has just blossomed um, with every every school that I know of, um, not the little elementary schools, but the other ones. It has just blossomed so much, and it's such a joy when you hear about high school students wanting to share their faith. That is a good thing. Oh, that is an accomplishment. So let them know he started when the pastor was three. (laughs) I always like tossing that in there. We will definitely keep him in our prayers because that is a joy. That is a huge joy right there. Any other prayers of joy or concern? Let's bow our heads, please. Merciful and loving God and forgiving God, please help those we lift up by name as well as those we've lifted up in our hearts. Give them strength and heal them. Help them to feel your love and embrace. We ask that you help us too. We need a spirit of love and acceptance to to flood into our lives this day. Even though we come to you this morning to worship you, Still, we harbor anger and vehemence against against others. We act out of frustration rather than love at times. We hoard your gifts and only grudgingly share our bounty with others. We find ways to turn our backs on you, claiming that other things are more important than our faith. And then in the midst of struggle and strife, we come back to you awash in tears and sorrow. We plead for your help and salvation. Remind us again, O Lord, that your love has always and will always be with us. You've called us to be witnesses to the the good things that can happen when we follow your ways. You've asked us to reach out across, across our borders, our oceans, our fears to others with reconciling love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Heal us from our selfishness and our apathy. Give us courage and strength for the ministries in which you have placed us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you could, let's get up and let's greet each other in the name of Christ. If you don't feel like shaking hands, just just wave. Give somebody an elbow bump. Give them a fist bump. But get up and greet each other in the name of Christ.
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pat. If you could, please rise and join me in the call to worship. We have great joy in Christ our Lord, who calls and heals us. Yet we are reminded that suffering produces endurance. And character produces hope. Amen, amen. Please be seated as we enjoy, unless you're the choir. If you're the choir, stand up. They, so I've been told that they are going to do a rendition. of they, They've scrapped the song they're doing now that they has in the bulletin, but they're going to do a rendition of a song by Coolio. And if you all don't know, that means you're over the age of 45, who Coolio is. Take it away, Pat. Amen, amen. Thank you. If you could, please, please bow your heads and close your eyes. Spirit of wisdom and hope, we witness your glory in the heavens and hear you call out to us. We're sometimes overwhelmed by the, by the thoughts of your compassionate care. Open our hearts this day to hear and respond in joy to your call that we may serve you faithfully all of our days. Amen. Amen, amen. Now, I'm going to skip this next song, Pat, and I'm going to go right to Jesus Loves Me. So if everybody could please rise and join me in hymn number 191. Jesus Loves Me.
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen, amen. Please be seated. So except for the rare special occasion, you will always find our offering plates at the very entrance of the sanctuary. Those doors. Um, but let's bow our heads and say a prayer for our tithes and offerings today. If you could, please bow your heads. Gracious and given God, we bring our tithes and offerings to you this day. And we pray it as we give them that they're going to kindle in us a, a deeper faith and a stronger commitment. We acknowledge that some of us have found our way back to you on our own. Others of us have lived in, into a faith that surrounded us from the time we were born, lived out in parents, grandparents, siblings, spouses. However, this faith found its way into our hearts or into our DNA. Help us to kindle it to flame that the world might be set on fire with your love and compassion. In Christ we pray as he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Amen, amen. Please rise and join me in singing hymn number 364, Because He Lives.
Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So we're in week two of this sermon series about being disciples of Christ, about following Jesus. The first step, as we went over last week, is, is knowing the one true God. The Scriptures were given to us so that we could know who God is and what God says. And if you remember, it's having that passion. It's having that desire to read it as if your life depends on it, because it does. Without the Scriptures, we would be blindly following a God that we have made up instead of boldly following the God who made us. The God of the good book wants you to know Him. And one of the most common questions I hear from people, and it even went on at, at Bible study this past Thursday, is how can I know that I know Jesus? And one of the best ways to answer that is in one of two questions, or both of two questions. What do you believe about Jesus? That is, do you follow the Jesus of Scripture? Or your Build-A-Bear version, where you build a version of Jesus that makes you happy? And then the second question, how do you behave? How do you behave? Because every day, every day we run into people, or we turn on the news, or open an app on our phone, or check out social media, read the newspaper, hear the radio, Go out into the world, and, and we see a hurting, messed up world that just makes you want to shake your head sometimes. And that's why we have this sermon series that we're in, and that's why we have this installment today called Character Counts. So if you could, please bow your heads. Father, we ask that by the power of, of your word and your indwelling spirit that you would lead us to walk and live in such a way that, that it honors you. By the power of your Spirit, help us to walk in your truth and glorify you, showing your love in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's scripture, even at 8.30 this morning, it almost changed on me because I was upstairs, I was working on stuff and praying about stuff. And I finally decided I was going to stick with 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. So if you got your Bible with you or your Bible app, if you don't, shame on you, bring your Bible to church, people. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8. And it starts, I can't impress this on you too strongly. God is looking over your shoulder. Christ himself is the judge with the final say on everyone, living and dead. He is about to break into the open with his rule. So proclaim the message with intensity. Keep on your watch, challenge, warn, and urge your people. Don't ever quit. Just keep it simple. And you're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching, but will fill up on spiritual junk food, catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on truth and chase mirages. But you, keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive. Do as thorough a job as God's servant. You take over. I'm about to die. My life and offering on God's altar. This is the only race worth running. I've run hard right to the finish. Believed all the way. All that's left now is the shouting. God's applause. Depend on it. He's an honest judge. He'll do right not only by me, but by everyone eager for his coming. And so ends today's scripture lesson. Amen. Where did I see that? Where did I see that? Yeah, here we go. Does this sound like anything you see outside today? People will have no stomach for God's word, but they're going to fill up on whatever junk food they can fill up on in order to just feel good and feel happy. That doesn't happen today, does it? Not a bit. And I was talking with, with y'all, and I was talking with a couple of people, and I was asking, how are you feeling? And here's something that I hear so much, and I can, re I can relate to it so much. I'm tired. I'm worn out. And there's so much going on in the world around us. It's very easy to get tired and worn out. But that doesn't mean that how we do and why we do and what we do has no meaning, because there is no doubt that how and why we do what we do is vital. 
We can often become so outcome-oriented that our character is compromised in order to get the result we earnestly desire. If not addressed and arrested, this can, over time, become a habit, a nasty habit. God cares about the how, and he cares about the why of what we do. The goal of our Christianity is to be transformed. The goal of our Christianity is to be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ. That means our purpose is to become more like Christ and less like us. It's not about how much we can do for Jesus. It's not about do as much as we can any way we can, because that just doesn't cut it. Anything that would cause us to compromise God's standard or God's word is not Christ-like and therefore cannot be justified. See, it's not about how much we can achieve, not how much we can amass, how much we can acquire, how much we can accumulate. It's not about stepping on people or putting others down or gossiping or slandering, lying by commission or omission. You all know there is a difference, right? And a lie is just a lie. It doesn't matter if it's by commission or omission. There's cheating, stealing, jealousy, greed, envy, or, or, or guile. You know, being a Christian should not involve exaggeration, half-truths, misleading others to make ourselves look better. It's not about selfish ambition or self-promotion. It is, it has been, and always will be about a relationship with Christ. But in our celebrity-obsessed, performance-oriented culture, it's so easy to become enamored with a person's or sometimes our own gifts, our own talents, our own achievements. Let's be determined as Christians not to idolize gifts. Gifts are given for God or given by God for service. And they actually reveal very little about the character of a person. A gift will not take you to your destiny. Character will. And what an opportunity we have as Christians. You know, we Christians have, and, and the church that, that the church has in this very moment to reach out to those hurting around us, to reach out to the world around us without hypocrisy, without competitiveness, without jealousy, without slander, without duplicity, without any of those things we see so much of in the world, but rather with grace, with love, with justice, with mercy, with kindness, with truth, with transparency and authenticity. And let's determine to be such people to have one single life, the life that is to be found in Christ, to have an intentional drive to become more like Christ with every single step and every single breath we take. See, in our text today, Paul is talking to Timothy and to us about our lives in Christ. He's talking about character. Now, the character of a person is how they think and how they act, distinctive to the individual. It's their nature. It's who they are under all the circumstances. And even when nobody's watching, they're still that person. But who we are supposed to be in Christ? Who are we supposed to be in Christ? Because that's all we're supposed to do is, is be who we are supposed to be in Christ. Remember that as a believer, we are to be in Christ with every single part of our life. That means when you're sitting in a pew on Sunday, when you're stuck in traffic on Monday, when you've got that annoying boss on Tuesday, when you've got those annoying neighbors on Wednesday, when you've got 17,000 cats populating your backyard on Thursday, you're supposed to be Christ. We do not have a Sunday morning person and the rest of the week person. We are to be Christians. Christ-like, every single day, 24-7. Our character is who we are when nobody is watching. Your character when it's 2 o'clock in the morning and your furnace blows. Not one we pretend to be when people are watching. Not the mask we wear, not the selfies we post on social media. It can be tough following Christ in a selfie-centered world that we find ourselves in. It's all about character. See, the time will come. They were moving into it, and I believe we are there. A time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine. 
In the Greek word, it means to have a healthy idea of, of what you believe. And I don't know about you guys, I don't see a lot of it out in the world today. I was talking with a bunch of high school kids, and this isn't going to represent all high school kids, but this is this group of high school kids, specifically this one high school kid. And it was a group of 15 of them. And I was asking about character, and I said, is it ever okay to lie? And the young lady said, yes, of course it is, if it gets me what I want. Really? And then she proceeded to say, no, I don't have my cell phone with me. Can I, can I use my cell phone next week? Because we have a no cell phone policy at, the, at this event. And I said, no, because you're going to lie to me. Your character matters. It's about having a healthy idea of what you believe. See, Paul in the scripture then shifts his advice to us with a series of imperatives that contrast those who are, who are in Christ and those who will be in the end days. He's talking character, what you are and not what you pretend to be. You know the people, they say the right things, they put on the right mask, they have the best selfies on social media to give people the impression that things could not possibly be better, that they are perfect. But what about your character? Have we lost the proper perspective? Have we lost maybe even ourselves. So the question is, as a Christian, as a person, are you hungry to regain control over your lives and put Christ first again? To work on growing the character of Christ. A lot of people go, oh yeah, Christ is first in my life. Oh yeah, I'm going to follow Christ. Oh yeah, my relationship with God is right. But then let's look and see how they behave right over here. Let's look and see how they behave right over here with these people. Does that line up? In general, people who are considered to have good character often have traits like integrity, honesty, courage, loyalty, fortitude, and other important virtues that promote good behavior. These character traits define who they are as a person and, and highly influence the choices they make in their lives. If the person is that type of person, not just for show, but for real, then their lives are going to stack up and line up with all those characteristics. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. So let's imagine this. It's Sunday morning. You're the liturgist. You get in your car to come to church. And oh, by the way, the batteries just died. Or let's say... You get up first thing in the morning, you get ready to go take a shower, and you realize water's been turned off. Or let's say many of thousands of other events that come up. Can we rejoice in all of those troubles? Paul tells us that our troubles produce endurance. Troubles meaning pressures. Nobody around here is going through any pressures at all, right? We don't have any stress at all, do we? Who here has stress? I'll be the honest one. If you got stress, raise your hand. I got five honest people in a group. Okay, six. We got stress. God uses that stress and uses these pressures to mold us into who he wants us to be. The pressures of life produce endurance. I'd rather he produced it some other way, or at least in smaller increments and in smaller, let's have some spaces out there. But he's got a way of doing things, and I trust his way. Because you want another word for endurance? Patience. Has anybody in here prayed for patience? Really? I have made it a policy. I never pray to God for patience or strength. Because I know he's going to give me something that's going to cause me to be patient. Or he's going to give me something that causes me to have that strength. Nobody prays for patience because we know how to, you know, we know to get it, we have to go through some stuff. Patience is how we stand on God's principles and on, on God's promises. Not our spirit that would lie down and let the floodwaters rush over us, but the, the spirit of the living God that meets things head on and overcomes by the power of God working. This fortitude, the, these troubles produce character. The weak word for character here is, is dokumi. And it means metal. 
It's a metal which has been passed through the fire so that everything unpure has been purged out of it. And when we come out of the fire, we're stronger, we're purer, we're better, we're nearer to God. What comes out of the godly purging is is the endurance and character that makes us more Christ-like, less like the world. It's that character, the character of being Christ-like, that produces hope. You remember that hope when we promise, when we trust in God's promises, it produces hope, that godly hope. And let's not fool ourselves. Just because you come out the other side, well, two people can suffer the same thing. They can go through the same situation. It might drive one to action, and it might drive the other one to despair. To one is the end of hope, and the other, it's a challenge to be Christ-like and filled with hope. Character that has endured the test always emerges with hope of the future. But you see, we have choices. Just like we have the choice about how we study the Word of God. And remember last week I mentioned about how it's like having that gold mine, and you walk in the gold mine, and you see gold, you see gold all over the walls, and you come out broke because <sighs> there wasn't any in my bucket. You mean I've got to dig for it? You mean I've got to put down the fork and I've got to go to Planet Fitness and not just walk in the door, but I've got to do the work too? That's not fair. We've got to do the work. We have choices. Has anybody ever done a home improvement project? Anybody? Does anybody love hanging drywall? I'm checking for me. This is pure selfish reasons right now, just just hypothetically. I do not like doing drywall, but I do know some home builders. And there was this one very well-known home builder that worked for this big company. And the man built some of the finest homes in this area year after year after year and had an incredible 40-year career of building homes and fantastic, beautiful homes. And as anyone who's done anything for 40 years toward the end of the career, he was tired. He was ready to go be a papa. He was ready to go raise his grandkids and enjoy. So when he was at year 35, he said, five more years, boss man, and I'm retiring. Then 36, and he said, four more years, and I'm retiring. And then it was three more years, and I'm retiring. Then I'm retiring in two years, boss, just letting you know. Two more years, that's it, I'm gone, I'm done. I'm retiring in six months. This shouldn't be catching you off, off you, know, you should be knowing this now, six months. And when the one-month mark came to his retirement, the owner of the company came up to him and said, could you build one more house? Just one more. And the guy was hurt. He was partially offended. He said, for four decades, I've been faithful to you. I've told you for a long time, for five years, my time is coming to an end. No, I'm not doing one more. And the owner says, come on, man. We've been good friends for such a long time, and you've been one of the best. You know, I wouldn't ask you to do this if it didn't mean a lot to me. Well, you do just one more home. And the guy said, fine, I'll do one more. But his heart wasn't in it. And this guy who normally built the best of the best of the best, he cut corners like he'd never cut corners before. He just wanted to get through it so he could finally go retire. He got the job done as fast as he possibly could. He used products that were not as good. He used cheaper subcontractors that didn't have integrity. On the outside of the house, it looked pretty. It looked beautiful. But he knew on the inside, it was far from his best work. At the end of the project, the owner came up to him with a big smile on his face, and he said, I want to tell you that we value your work more than you could ever possibly imagine. And his gratitude for 40 years of service, we want to give you this as your way out. These are your keys to your new home. And the builder recognized what all of us will recognize one day, and that is this. You, each one of you, is building your home right now. Every decision you make, every choice you make, how you live, what you say, and what you do, you are building your own home. 
Whether you choose to be generous with people or selfish in your relationships with others, whether you do what's right or you cut corners, whether you show honor and build others up or show dishonor and tear others down, whether you extend grace or judge people harshly, whether you tell the truth about what happened or tell a story in a way that benefits you, how you treat others or how you only think of yourself and what you want, you are building your own house. There was a family I talked to once, a single mother, young mother, three young kids, and I walked up to her one day and I said, look at the way you're living. Now look at your children. That's your legacy. How you live and how you allow others to treat you is how they're going to believe they should treat themselves and they should treat others. Is that what you want? See, your character, it matters. And I've often been told, pastor, left to ourselves, we can never, ever, ever live the Christian life. It's impossible. The standards are too high. We can't make ourselves change on the inside no matter how much willpower we have. What we need is somebody from the outside to come to us and change us on the inside. Guess what? That someone is Jesus. The way to live the Christian life is to be Christ-centered and Christ-controlled. Each day we make the choice whether to acknowledge Jesus as the center of our lives, around which everything else revolves, or put ourselves in that place every single day, we make the choice to voluntarily surrender the control of our lives to Christ, or to grab the reins and assume control ourselves. See, over the years, I've never forgotten those questions. There have been times when I lived Christ-centered and Christ-controlled, and in those moments, the Spirit of God produced in me the character of Christ and a desire to live out the, comp the competencies of Jesus. But honestly, if somebody here is going to be honest today, there have also been days when Jesus hadn't been the center of my life. I've been busy working out my plans. I remember when I came to addressing my calling, I told my, my pastor, Reverend Ravel, I said, Frankie, I feel myself being called, but totally ignore that. I got plans. So did God. There are times when each of us get busy working out our plans, our way, with our efforts. And in those days, Jesus is not in control of our lives. The result is that we give very little thought to the character and competencies of Jesus. See, a true disciple, we know we're not supposed to be perfect, but a true disciple of Jesus moves in his direction. And we all have room to grow. I'm not saying that a disciple has all of, all of this down perfectly. What I am saying is that a true disciple of Jesus is moving in his direction. The spirit within him is working on him and his desire to live just like Christ. The Apostle Paul told his young disciple Timothy, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress the key word in that, by the way, 1 Timothy 4.15, the key word in that is progress. He didn't say, Timothy, you have to be perfect. You must have it all together all the time. You can't be a hot mess. He just said, keep moving forward. That was Paul's goal even for himself. Just keep moving forward. And I love how the Apostle Paul put it when he said, not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul wasn't perfect. He hadn't reached full maturity. He hadn't planted his flag on the mountaintop of Christ's likeness, but he was pressing toward it. He was making progress. His desire was to be like Jesus on the inside and on the outside. And this should be the desire of every true disciple, of every true Christian. Let's bow our heads, please. So, Father, we pray today that you do, just do surgery on us. 
we recognize, God, that, that all of us probably have room for the Holy Spirit to do some work. So God, search me. Search all of us. Wherever we're inconsistent, wherever we are the hypocrite, we ask you to forgive us. We thank you for your forgiveness. We ask that you would direct our steps in a way that only comes by your power. Help us to walk in the ways of the wise, to walk with steps of integrity, to please you in all that we do. Help me to be open to what you would show me. Search my heart. And we ask, God, that you show us that, and that you transform us, and God, that you would even forgive us wherever we've been wrong. Help us to be centered around Jesus and all that we do, empowered by your Holy Spirit and showing your love. Direct our steps. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. On that note, please rise and join me in singing hymn number 374. 374. So it all fits together. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. It all fits together. Number one, you cannot have the character of Christ if, number one, you've never read the Bible. If, number two, you've never studied the Bible. How can you have the character of someone you have no idea who they are? And we're going to be returning to some Bible study classes here coming up in um, November. But take the time. Just like when like you're paying attention, if, you know, I think it was uh, last week I said about how the airline attendants, they're, they're going, oh, by the way, the little whistle and the cup and the flotation device, and I'm ignoring them, but then the pilot comes on and says, oh, by the way, we're going to have to make an emergency landing, and then they come back and they go through the instructions again, and next time, you better believe you're paying attention, because your life depends on it, and your life does depend on what's in the Bible. 
So take the time to study. Take the time to read. Take the time to learn it. And then take the time to progress each step you take. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. But guess what? We're forgiven. It's just all in the intent. It's all in what is in your heart. So take the time to start to become more and more Christ-like with every step. And then share that with everybody you come across. Share that love. Share that hope. And just imagine how much that's going to transform the world if everybody was doing the same thing. So go forth and be that light and a rainy day to somebody. Amen. God bless. SPRC meeting tomorrow night.